food crisis. Leaders meeting in Madrid are tackling food insecurity around the world on the final day of their summit. They've declared Russia as their biggest strategic threat. We'll get the latest from the talks. Also coming up. Three foreigners captured while fighting with Ukraine are awaiting a death sentence issued by Russian-backed separatists. DW meets the friends and family trying to rally support for their cause. And the son of a dictator takes office in the Philippines. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is sworn in as president after winning a landslide election. At his inauguration, he praises his disgraced father for getting things done. Plus. Public gatherings are banned and internet access is blocked to quell unrest in India. That's after Muslim men boast of killing a Hindu man. Hello, I'm Terry Martin. Good to have you with us. NATO leaders are holding the final day of talks at their summit in Madrid. They're addressing rising food prices and insecurity caused by Russia's war on Ukraine. NATO leaders say Russia's blockade of grain exports is sparking instability around the world, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. Earlier at the summit, alliance members announced a new strategic plan, naming Russia as the biggest threat. Sweden and Finland have been formally invited to join NATO, and the U.S. has promised to bolster its forces stationed in Europe. NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and the U.S. President Joe Biden are expected to speak soon. We'll cross live to those statements as they happen. Well, here to walk us through this pivotal NATO summit is DW political correspondent Julia Saudelli. And on the ground in Madrid is DW Brussels bureau chief Alexandra von Namen. Alexandra, let's start with you. For those of our viewers who haven't been following this uh, summit closely, what have the most important developments been so far? Well, we had here two major developments. I would say, first of all, of all, of course, uh, the strategic concept that uh, NATO leaders we, were able to agree on. <coughs> and in this strategic concept, Russia is not seen as a strategic partner anymore. Russia is now considered to be the most significant and direct threat to NATO's security. And uh, then uh, other things that need to be said here is that for the very first time, China is also mentioned in this strategic concept, China as a source of systemic challenges. And maybe one more word on that, uh, climate change is also uh, being mentioned that there as a defining threat of uh, challenge, I'm sorry, uh, of our time. And another major development here is that NATO is determined to boost its uh, high readiness forces, promising to to increase their number from 40,000 right now to 300,000. Julia, there's been a lot of criticism of Germany's response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the German government under Olaf Scholz has been trying to counter that criticism. What's the mood now in Germany regarding the war in Ukraine and Germany's role within NATO and its defense posture? I think there has been uh, quite a big shift in German uh, security and foreign policy since uh, the war in Ukraine started. And that could already be seen a few days after uh, the war began when uh, Olaf Scholz in the German parliament pledged up to 100 billion euros uh, to spend on defense, something that he called the turning point. And after that, Germany was maybe slow in uh, delivering weapons, especially heavy weapons to Ukraine, where that's where a lot of the criticism came in and even though it was slow especially with the heavy weapons they are slowly being delivered to Ukraine and for a country like Germany that had um, been in the years before uh, now 
almost reluctant to inf invest more in defense. It had been criticized strongly also by former President, uh, U.S. President Donald Trump because of its uh, reluctance to invest in defense. For Germany to make such a move, it is quite an important change. And we've seen that also uh, the citizens of Germany are going along with this decision to invest more in defense and, um, and focus more on defense. They agree that heavy weapons should be delivered to Ukraine. They agree that uh, more investment should be put in the military. Well, we'll be hearing more from Chancellor Scholz uh, later in the program. He is scheduled to give a news conference in about half an hour, 45 minutes from now. Russian President Vladimir Putin used the threat of NATO expansion as a pretext for invading Ukraine. He's stopped short of making a similar threat in response to Finland and Sweden joining the military alliance. But he did issue this warning. Let's listen in. We don't have we do not have the same problems with Sweden and Finland that, unfortunately, we do with Ukraine. We have no territorial issues or disputes. We have nothing to worry about in terms of Finland and Sweden joining NATO. If that's what they want, that's up to them. But they need to understand that there was no threat to them before. Now, if military contingents and infrastructure are deployed there, Russia will have no choice but to respond in kind. So, uh, President Putin there saying that Russia will respond in kind to further NATO deployments along its border. Alexander, what's the reaction been to Putin's comments there in Madrid? Well, I had a chance to ask this a question to the Estonian Prime Minister, Kaya Kalas, and she told me that she is not very concerned about those threats because, as she said, that's what Russia does. They uh, threaten, they vow to take action. Uh, and she is uh, rather expecting that we might see cyber attacks coming out or launch, being launched in Russia or airspace violation or disinformation campaigns as a reaction to Sweden and uh, Finland uh, um, wanting to join NATO. And uh, that is what I've been hearing a lot from NATO officials here. They are saying that they do not think that Russia would right now have uh, the capabilities or, and also the will to launch any military action against uh, NATO territory and against Finland and Sweden. Now, top of the agenda uh, in Madrid today is the growing s crisis surrounding food security. Uh, Russia uh, and Ukraine in particular, m big suppliers of agricultural products, particularly grain, sunflower oil, whatnot, to the rest of the world. Uh, this is a big problem for the world as a whole. We're seeing prices rising and, and access to food becoming difficult. Now, M Germany is blaming Russia specifically for causing this. Uh, what is Germany doing to try to solve the crisis, though, Julia? Well, there are common efforts between a lot of uh, actors going on trying to find a way to get this grain out of Ukraine and be distributed to the countries that uh, really need it. Uh, we'd heard, we've heard also from leaders at the G7 summit that just happened now just before the NATO summit how important of an issue this is. If we look, for example, at security even, uh, the lack of food in a lot of countries around the world can cause security issues and that's why leaders really want to, to address it. And uh, we've heard heard, um, for example, from Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi, how he thinks uh, there is some optimism in terms of these negotiations with trying to get the grain out of Ukraine. There are different possible solutions. One would be to transport it out via uh, sea, uh, but there are still some security concerns regarding that possibility. The other is to try to get this grain out through land, through Romania and uh, Moldova. Uh, but. Uh, there is a need for Russia to agree to some security guarantees for this grain to be transported out. So the negotiations are ongoing, but there is definitely a push coming from Germany and other uh, Western countries to try to solve the situation quickly because the next harvest in Ukraine is coming. Well, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg is due to hold a news conference at that NATO summit shortly. We'll cross live to Madrid when it happens. Uh, Julia Alexander, thank you for now.
Meanwhile, Russia says it has withdrawn its forces from Ukraine's strategic Snake Island in the Black Sea. Uh, Russia's defense secretary, the defense ministry, called it, quote, a goodwill gesture uh, that showed it wasn't blocking Ukrainian grain exports. Ukrainian officials said that the withdrawal followed its missile and artillery strikes on Russia's garrison. Uh, Snake Island became a symbol of Ukrainian resistance at the start of the war when Ukrainian soldiers rebuffed a Russian warship's demand to surrender, and the audio went viral. Let's bring in DW correspondent Emmanuel Shaz, who is in the Ukrainian port city of Odessa. Uh, Emmanuel, Russia says it's pulling out of Snake Island as a goodwill gesture. What do you make of that? Well, Terry, I think it's very interesting to see that framing uh, of, of what happens uh, from the Russian perspective. Uh, they said they had, they wanted to show goodwill, that Russia wanted to show that they had no interest in blocking, uh, for example, UN humanitarian corridors in uh, the Black uh, the Black Sea. Uh, so that's for the Ukrainian, pers for the Russian, pardon me, perspective. On the Ukrainian side, of course, it is a symbolic retake of the Snake Island. You said. Uh, you said it earlier, this had been, uh, well, one of the first victories for Russia on the onset of the war. This island where 13 Ukrainian border guards had uh, told Russians, uh, uh, well, where to go, like two Russian ships, warships had uh, captured the island, including the Moscow, the Moskva warship, which has since, uh, had since been, uh, uh, you know, uh, since uh, been, uh, in the at the bottom of the Black Sea, with no news from uh, from the Russian soldiers that were on board, so very significant, also a huge morale boost for Ukrainian troops and for Ukrainians here. Sounds like you're really uh, under a deluge there with the rain falling. Uh, Emma, I hope you can hear me. Uh, what can you tell us about the prisoners swap between Ukraine and Russia that happened yesterday? Well, again, a very significant moment in that war. There have been uh, prisoners exchanged uh, in the past, but usually it was about 12, 15, 20 soldiers from both sides. This time, we're talking about 144 soldiers on both sides, and it includes on the Ukrainian side the return of 95 uh, soldiers who fought uh, in the Azovstal steel plant, including 43 soldiers from the Azov uh, Battalion, uh, a regiment which uh, was a paramilitary military group which joined the Ukrainian army a few years back and uh, the Russian rhetoric is that this uh, group is a far-right group and they had always said before that those soldiers would be tried on Russian territory so that's really significant also because here in Ukraine those soldiers are considered as heroes. Ibrahim Sadun left for the front lines with his childhood teddy bear strapped to his military kit. He came to Ukraine from Morocco to study aerospatial sciences, but last November swapped his student visa for a military one and joined the army, much to the surprise of his friends. I was against that. And one of the main arguments he gave me was the fact that he's kind of feeling useless, so he wants to do something useful and find himself. But Brahim didn't serve long. He fought in Mariupol and surrendered to Russian forces, along with over a thousand fellow servicemen, mid-April. But the separatist authorities didn't treat him like a Ukrainian prisoner of war. They argued he was a foreign mercenary and put him on trial, along with two Britons. They are the first foreign fighters to be tried since the beginning of the war. At the beginning of June, all three were sentenced to death. Ukrainian authorities and NGOs both reject this verdict, as the separatist court in Donbas is not recognized by Kiev or by the international community. It's a propaganda show, and in this case, first of all, the issue on the institution, so-called court, that provided this verdict. The death uh, sentence is uh, not uh, uh, applicable and available 
on Ukrainian territory. We are on Ukrainian territory. So we consider it like the action of terrorist organization. And it's pure terrorist act that should be condemned and uh, uh, severely punished uh, on international and national level. We are dealing with the big terrorist group supported by terrorist state. For Brahim's family, the trial and death sentence came as a shock and they say they haven't received any help from the Moroccan authorities so far. The moment when I seen the video of his captivity, I tried to contact the Moroccan embassy and where I am right now and they literally were like, what do you expect us to do? I tried to reach many other uh, authorities and sadly everything was silent. I feel like they're just like scared to talk about it maybe. like literally just trying to keep it down, like he doesn't exist at all. Just like his family, Brahim's friends feel very alone in trying to help him out of this situation. They have launched a social media campaign and canvassed all around the city. We saw that these are very effective when we put a, a QR code on them because people started texting us on the social media campaign that we started, Say Brahim. They're like, we saw those posters around the city and what can we do to help? Brahim's friend and family put what hope they have in the support they get from the public. While the separatists remain in charge in Donbass, that's about the only thing they can do. Well, the European uh, Court of Human Rights sees the case of Brahim Sadoum along with that of the two Britons uh, he was sentenced to death uh, with, and the uh, European Court said it has taken measure to inform Russia that it shouldn't carry out uh, the sentence and that it should treat the prisoners of war according, according to the conventions protecting their rights. Manuel, Russian missiles continue to pound Ukrainian cities around the country. Is it clear what Russia is trying to achieve with these strikes, how they fit into Moscow's declared aim of taking control of the Donbass region. Well, I think there are two sides uh, of the objectives. First, when we see indiscriminate shelling on uh, civilian targets, for example, the supermarket in Kremenchuk on Monday uh, or uh, in Kiev on Sunday uh, morning on a residential uh, building, I think, you know, there's something to the fact that maybe they want to intimidate the population or just to inflict a blow to the morale of people here. And it does, uh, you know, it does work. People are, you know, uh, they are resilient, but they are quite shocked by those attacks on civilians. But there's also the aim to uh, control Donbass, and that's why we see heavy fighting on the eastern front line, especially around Lizzy Chance. The Russian troops have tried uh, several times now to storm into uh, the city. There's still uh, over a thousand inhabitants there, but they live in very dire situation with no water, no electricity, uh, you know, with constant uh, shelling. So uh, the fighting very much continues on on the eastern side, which is still an objective for Russia. Russia. Emma, thank you very much. That was our correspondent Emmanuel Shahs there uh, on a very rainy day in the port city of Odessa. It's the remarkable return of a disgraced political dynasty. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has been sworn in as president of the Philippines more than three decades after his father was ousted as dictator. Marcos Jr., also known as Bongbong, took the oath of office after winning elections by a landslide. He was joined on stage at his inauguration by his mother, Imelda. Marcos Jr. praised his father, who ruled by martial law for nearly a decade, as a leader who got things done. He has pledged to unite the country, create more jobs, and tame inflation. Let us now witness. You pick me to be your servant, to enable changes to benefit all. I fully understand the gravity of the responsibility that you've put on my shoulders. I do not take it lightly but I am ready for the task. And DW correspondent Georg Matas attended the inauguration of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. in Manila, where thousands of people came out to show their support for the new president. 
It's the very moment that thousands of supporters of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. here at the National Museum in the heart of Manila have been waiting for. 36 years after being ousted from the Philippines, the Marcos dynasty is back in the seat of power. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. now faces an uphill battle to keep his election promises, like cutting the price of rice in half as inflation in the country is rising sharply. He will also have to balance relations between two superpowers, the United States on the one hand and China that has sent its vice president to the inauguration ceremony here in Manila on the other hand. The most difficult task of all, however, will be uniting a nation that is deeply split over its past. The opponents of Ferdinand Marcos Jr., but in particular the victims of the martial law period under his father, are deeply concerned that the son could bring back the dark days of the dictatorship. A period that Ferdinand Marcos Jr. himself refers to as the golden era of the Philippines. And if you talk to supporters of Marcos here at the National Museum, that is exactly what they hope that Marcos will bring back to the Philippines. He's intelligent. He can manage everything, just like his dad, even, even better. He is a uh, very proud and uh, best man in, uh, in our country because he is the good leader in honor of his dad. He's going to continue the legacy of Duterte to fight against a uh, drug syndicate. He's, he is a very kind and uh, I think the Philippines will rise again. That report from DW's Georg Matis in Manila. Now to some other stories making headlines around the world. Chinese President Xi Jinping has arrived in Hong Kong for celebrations marking the 25th anniversary of the former British colony's handover to China. It's Xi's first trip outside mainland China uh, since the start of the pandemic. Security is tight to keep both COVID-19 and any signs of political dissent in check. Officials in Tokyo have urged businesses and residents to save power as Japan's record-breaking heat wave continues for the sixth day. Daytime highs are hovering at around 40 degrees Celsius. The hot spell follows the earliest end to the capital's rainy season in decades. Temperatures are not forecast to drop until next week. Israeli lawmakers have voted to dissolve parliament. The move triggers the fifth national election in less than four years and makes Foreign Minister Yair Lapid interim prime minister. He is taking over from Naftali Bennett, who says he will not run for re-election in the vote set for November 1st. For the first time in Germany, a black politician has become member of a state government. Amanita Touré, a 29-year-old member of the Green Party, has been named Minister for Social Affairs in the state of Schleswig-Holstein. Touré is the daughter of two Malian refugees. Tensions are high in India after, two, after police arrested two Muslim men accused of murdering a Hindu man and posting a video of it online. It comes after months of clashes between Hindus and Muslims. In response to the latest unrest, public gatherings have been banned and internet access suspended across parts of India. Fire and fury on the streets in India. The sectarian murder of a Hindu tailor by two Muslim men in the northern state of Rajasthan has sparked outrage across the country. Tensions are running high amid several mass public protests. In the capital, Delhi, right-wing Hindu nationalist groups clashed with police as they vented their anger over the killing. We are protesting the killing of Kanaya Lal, who in spite of asking for police protection was not given any. This is a protest against the government, this is a protest to get justice for Kanaya, and this is a protest against the ever-increasing jihadi mindset in the country. The demonstrations continued at Kanaya Lal's cremation on Wednesday. His killers were arrested by police after they filmed themselves carrying out the murder in his shop in the city of Udaipur. In a second video, they threatened the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Their apparent motive was that the murdered man had recently praised the controversial political figure Nupur Sharma in a Facebook post, a move for which he was arrested before being released on bail. 
His bereaved wife told journalists the Facebook post was the sole reason for the killing. There was nothing else, just Facebook. They killed him for such a small thing. <laughs> Sharma, a well-known political figure, recently incensed Muslims in India and elsewhere by making derogatory remarks about the Prophet Muhammad, resulting in protests from Muslims. The ruling BJP party suspended her as a result. Officials in Udaipur have rushed to quell the religious tensions before they get any worse. They have imposed a curfew amid clashes with protesters and have tried to stop the murder video from spreading further online. But the killing has exposed the sectarian fault lines which run deep in a country run by a Hindu nationalist party, but in which around 170 million citizens are Muslims. Just a reminder, we are waiting for a news conference in, uh, in Madrid where, NATO, where the NATO uh, summit is taking place. We hope to hear from NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg as soon as he uh, begins that news conference, so we might be breaking into our programming here in a moment. Now, a French court has handed down the maximum possible sentence for the only surviving perpetrator of the 2015 Paris terror attacks. Salah Abdesalam will serve life without parole for his part in a series of bombings and shootings which killed 130 people. 19 other men were also found guilty for planning or aiding the attacks. It brings to an end a long-running trial with victims expressing their relief. Salah Abdesalam now faces life in prison the toughest sentence available under French law. He's the sole surviving member of the Islamic State terror cell that carried out the deadly attacks in Paris in November 2015. The series of gun and bomb attacks killed 130 people in the French capital. The deadliest incident occurred at the Bataclan Theater. 90 concert goers left dead after gunmen opened fire. For those who survived, the conclusion of the 10-month trial in this specially built Paris courthouse is just one step in the remedial process. Tonight, my reaction to the verdict is that I am relieved, but I am not proud, because no one is ever proud when people are condemned to heavy penalties. I am relieved because one part of the process is now behind us, but we are still fighting to be reimbursed for our suffering by the government, and we will not give up this fight. It was justice, for sure, but justice can do everything. Justice is just, you know, applying the rule of law, uh, and it's not healing everything. We'll see that. It will help us heal, but we still have work to do, obviously. Another 19 people were also found guilty. Their crimes included planning and logistical support. Just 14 appeared in court. The others presumed dead or missing. The biggest trial in the history of the modern republic has come to a close. A welcome moment, no doubt, but far from the end for those afflicted by France's deadliest peacetime attack. Our correspondent Lisa Lewis was at the sentencing in Paris and told us more about the main suspect, Salah Abdel Salam. Salah Abdeslam was indeed the only one of those accused that was in Paris on the 13th of November 2015. And in front of the court, he himself and the others have been depicting a somehow contradictory picture of Salah Abdeslam. At the beginning of the trial, he was saying, he was saying, you know, calling himself a fighter of so called Islamic State, the terror organization that has claimed responsibility for the attacks here in Paris in 2015 and then during the trial he seemed to try to explain his acts and said you know I really want to apologize and say sorry to the victims and yet he did never really condemn 
the attacks. In the end, though, the bottom line for the court seems to have been that they consider Salah Abdeslam a terrorist indeed, and he did get the highest penalty at all, you know, in, in France, in French law. Uh, life in jail, and this time in jail, cannot be reduced. This is very tough indeed. That was DW's Lisa Lewis there in Paris. Well, the NATO summit is taking place in Madrid. This is the second day of that two-day summit. We're expecting it to uh, wrap up shortly. We expect to hear statements uh, from NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, also the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, uh, uh, and perhaps also U.S. President Joe Biden. We're going to try to carry those news conferences for you live. Let's cross straight over to our correspondent in Madrid who's covering that summit for us, Alexandra von Naman. Alexandra, you've been following those talks now for the past two days. Uh, we were supposed to have seen the NATO Secretary General about 15 minutes ago. The news conference was scheduled for then. Do we know what's delayed him and what can we expect uh, him to say today? Well, normally, of course, uh, you would be right saying that NATO is always on time with the uh, Secretary General always uh, being on time for his press conferences. However, we are talking here about a summit a meeting uh, where all the NATO leaders have a chance to talk and be together. So it's not very surprising that we have a slight delay. Um, now there are different bilateral meetings still going on at the last a session was uh, about food insecurity, a very important topic. So maybe that is a reason for the delayed press conference. But we are expecting it to uh, begin soon because, of course, this will be just one of many, many press conferences that will be held here uh, in Madrid by uh, NATO leaders. And we heard yesterday already uh, some major announcements coming out of NATO with its new strategic concept. It's overhauled this key policy document uh, for the first time in 12 years. NATO saying it's the most that Russia is the most serious uh, security threat right now to the alliance. Also naming China, saying that uh, uh, China proposes a systemic challenge for the alliance. And now China has responded to that, Alexandra, saying that. The, accusing the alliance of maliciously attacking and smearing the country. And it said, it says, quote, that NATO claims other countries pose challenges, but it is NATO that is creating problems around the world. Is NATO taking this on board? Because there has been some criticism of NATO, uh, not just from China, but from other countries as well. Yes, but according to NATO, it is important for this um, alliance, which is a defense alliance, to be ready to address the, the uh, current threats and challenges. And that is why, from their perspective, it is important to update their strategic concept. The last one was approved in 2010. And since then, of course, we understand that the whole security assessment and the security situation in the Euro-Atlantic area has massively changed with the war on Ukraine, of course, that now has to be taken into account and the consequences of Russia's aggression. And of course, in this uh, strategic concept, the alliance is also stating, even though they are using different wording on Russia and on China, as you just mentioned, they are stating that both countries are trying to undercut the rules-based international order. And of course, they need to be prepared to address uh, uh, those issues. Julia, uh, NATO is going to massively boost its presence uh, in Europe, particularly its rapid, rapid reaction forces. They're going to increase those numbers from 40,000 to 300,000, keeping the, the forces in the home countries, but having them ready to be deployed to Europe at a moment's notice if they need to be. Uh, this strengthening of NATO's posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia, how is how are Germans responding to this? Because it's been a, a big watershed moment for Germany in terms of its posture towards Russia and indeed its support for Ukraine. How, how much support is there for Chancellor Schultz's policies and NATO's policies in, in dealing with Russia in the Ukraine war? 
Well, we have seen an increase in support for uh, not only military support for Ukraine directly, but also in upping uh, budgets and interest actually in, in, in defense and in Germany's military. So we do see that Germany's population is going along with the policies that uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is putting forward. Uh, the Chancellor has always tried to maintain a balance between uh, upping Germany's uh, military investment and also uh, pushing forward a, a bigger military development in Germany and NATO as well, but also trying not to provoke Russia. This has been a topic that has been quite strongly debated here in Germany and uh, which was also criticized sometimes because that meant that uh, Germany was sometimes slow in committing to weapon deliveries to Ukraine, especially in terms of heavy weapons. Uh, but the Chancellor has been trying to walk this, this fine line of committing more military uh, power, but also not provoking Russia because uh, the, the last thing that Germany and NATO want is for Russia to actually go after a NATO member. That would mean that the entirety of NATO would have to intervene in its defense. Uh, just a reminder to our viewers, we are waiting for a press conference to begin with the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. We were just looking at some live pictures from the summit venue where you could see the podium, the stage as they wait for that, wait for that to get underway. Uh, with me in the studio is Julia Saldelli, our political correspondent. Julia, uh, Chancellor Schultz's government consists of three parties. Uh, these parties are not always on the same page when it comes to policy. They were looking very united going in to the new government when, after the election in September. But then came the Russia's invasion of Ukraine on February 24th. Uh, this has been a difficult period for uh, Chancellor Schultz's new government, to say the least. How much unity is there within the coalition on Ukraine policy and uh, defense policy in general? Overall, we've seen the government working together and, and sharing the, the general uh, prospects of, of, of what Germany should do and should continue to do. Uh, we've seen some slight differences, and those differences were present already before these parties came together and formed this government. Uh, the Green Party, uh, who uh, now has uh, the foreign minister and the economy minister, uh, were already... Uh, stronger, let's say, than, than, so, than Scholz and his Social Democrats in terms of criticizing Russia and criticizing China and alerting people to, to the danger that these two countries pose. And they, they wanted the government to be stronger and taking a stronger stance against these two countries. Also in terms, for example, of energy independence, the Greens were against the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline that was meant to bring more Russian gas to Germany already before the war happened. And uh, then... Uh, uh, the Social Democratic Chancellor Olaf Scholz had to go along with this once the war started. But overall, we've seen quite some, some unity and uh, everyone is now aware that uh, the, the stance of Germany towards Russia and towards NATO uh, has had to change. Alexandra, uh, yesterday we heard major announcements concerning uh, NATO's military uh, development, its strategic concept. But uh, today I understand that the delegates there in Madrid are addressing the question of food security, uh, not just within the NATO alliance, but around the world. What can NATO do to uh, assure food security on a global scale? Well, that's a very important question, and uh, the key question is really whether NATO can do anything at all as alliance or whether it might be up to individual NATO, NATO allies to, to, help, to solve, uh, help solve this problem. And, of course, we know that uh, uh, NATO is saying uh, it is Russia to be blamed for this current food insecurity. Russia is blocking the Ukrainian ports, and Russia is also using food as weapon, saying that it is only happening because uh, the Western world imposed sanctions against the country, with uh, the Western world saying, no, uh, we didn't impose any sanctions on food. But uh, when we, it comes to practical solutions uh, or proposals that are on the table, like, for instance, uh, using Western forces to demine the waters in the Black Sea or using Western warships to make sure that uh, the transport of grain out of Ukraine could be possible. That is, of course, very, a very difficult task because it's clear that uh, NATO allies, they don't want to get 
involved uh, in, in the war there. So uh, I don't think that we really can expect any uh, concrete proposals how to solve the food uh, crisis or the, the food insecurity. Uh, rather, I expect uh, uh, the NATO Secretary General to speak about uh, the discussions that are still underway. And of course, they are trying to get everyone on board. The United Nations are already on board trying to find a solution to the problem. Now you mentioned, Alexandra, that the NATO member states, uh, there are 30 of them at this point, uh, before Sweden and Finland join, they've been invited. Uh, they do not want to become, a, become party to this war, to get involved directly in a confrontation with Russia. But when Finland does join, this will give a 1,300 kilometer border between a NATO member state and Russia directly. Uh, Russia, of course, is, is concerned about that as well. Um, first of all, when can we expect to see Finland and Sweden formally join NATO? And what is NATO doing to, uh, what, are its, what are its plans along that eastern flank, uh, you know, along that new border uh, in Finland? Well, I think that we can expect that Sweden's and Finland's uh, membership, that they will be approved as new members uh, quite quickly. Normally, it could take a year or longer, but uh, since uh, all the 30 members now invited Sweden and Finland to join the alliance uh, and with the protocols that are needed to be signed already drafted, we can expect it to happen pretty fast. However, uh, we have to say that after those protocols are being signed, we then uh, have to have all 30 uh, members of NATO ratify those uh, protocols. And there are different procedures in different countries. For instance, in Germany, the parliament has to approve those protocols. But uh, it won't be difficult to integrate Finland and Sweden into the alliance because both countries countries uh, are already very close partners. They have been participating in NATO missions. They have been training with NATO forces. And of course, uh, for them to join NATO, it's also a win-win situation for the alliance because their armies are very well equipped, uh, well trained. And uh, actually, we have to stress that uh, both countries are capable of defending their borders. But of course, for them, they feel safe and better protected against any Russian aggression. Uh, when they join NATO. And then we will see how and if at all NATO forces will be deployed to Finland and at the Russian border, uh, because of course that uh, will be watched very closely by the Kremlin that has already announced uh, that they are going to beef up their presence at the border there. Alexandra, thank you for now. That was our correspondent, our Brussels bureau chief, Alexandra von Naumann, there attending the NATO summit in Madrid as we wait for the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg to begin his news conference. We'll be carrying that live. Uh, still with me in the studio, Julia Saudelli, our political correspondent here as well. Well, let's, uh, as we wait for that news conference to get underway, let's catch up on some other news. Here in Germany, the largest contemporary art show is underway in the city of Kassel. The Documenta hosts a huge number of artworks by artists from around the world, but one large mural has been removed after it was found to have anti-Semitic images. It's sparked a discussion about how the art show handles controversy. It was a full house for the first real debate about the anti-Semitism scandal at Documenta 15. There were experts on stage, and in the audience, a member of the Indonesian curatorial collective Ruan Grupa, who greeted the crowd in conciliatory tones. This is a very uh, good occasion to, to let you know also that we are here uh, in the, to learn, to listen. Yet the contentious work in question is no longer there. For two days, a sprawling banner hung in the middle of Kassel. Among its many images were two figures criticized as clearly anti-Semitic, a Mossad soldier with the head of a pig, and a man with sidelocks often associated with Orthodox Jews 
fangs and an SS insignia on his hat. It's the work of the Indonesian art group Taring Padi, which enjoys cult status in its home country. In Kassel, the rest of their work is currently staged at a former indoor swimming pool. Cardboard figures with strong political messages, large format banners, and a tank made of papier-mâché on which visitors can write their own messages. The artists of Taring Padi were shocked by the intensity of the protests. They felt that they were left completely on their own by the documenta management. How does it feel for artists working collectively to have their work removed? There was no announcement, no dialogue, no discussion about what we wanted to express with this artwork. Meron Mendel, a German-Israeli historian and educator, organized the panel to facilitate that dialogue. He criticizes the fact that no one is taking responsibility. You have to accept, value and listen to the perspective of others. This won't work if people from Indonesia come and say, this is how it is, like it or leave it. But it also won't work if you just point the finger at them and say, do this or you're out. In the muddled debate, Hortensia Völkers, who sponsors many cultural projects, fears that there will now be calls for more curatorial control. I have serious doubts about this. And I'm a supporter of a culture in Germany that gives the institutions autonomy, but also great responsibility. Nobody really took on this responsibility at the Documenta, and at present they're releasing no statements. But perhaps now the controversy also offers the chance for a genuine dialogue. Let's catch up on some other stories making headlines around the world today. Chinese President Xi Jinping has arrived in Hong Kong for celebrations marking the 25th anniversary of the former British colony's handover to China. It's Xi's first trip outside mainland China since the start of the pandemic. Security is tight, uh, both to keep COVID-19 uh, in check and uh, any signs of political dissent as well. Officials in Tokyo have urged businesses and residents to save power as Japan's record-breaking heat wave continues for the sixth day. Daytime highs are hovering at around 40 degrees Celsius. The hot spell follows the earliest end to the capital's rainy season in decades. Temperatures are not forecast to drop until next week. Israeli lawmakers have voted to dissolve parliament. The move triggers the fifth national election in less than four years and makes Foreign Minister Yair Lapid interim prime minister. He's taking over from Naftali Bennett, who says he will not run for re-election in the vote set for November 1st. For the first time in Germany, a black politician has become member of a state government. Aminata Touré, a 29-year-old member of the Green Party, was named Minister for Social Affairs in the state of Schleswig-Holstein. Touré is the daughter of two Malian refugees. Russia says it has withdrawn its forces from Ukraine's strategic Snake Island in the Black Sea. Russia's defense ministry called it a, quote, goodwill gesture that showed it was, was not blocking Ukrainian grain exports. Ukrainian officials said the withdrawal followed its missile and artillery strikes on Russia's garrison. Snake Island became a symbol of Ukrainian resistance at the start of the war when Ukrainian soldiers rebuffed a Russian warship's demand to surrender and the audio recording went viral. DW correspondent Emmanuel Shaz is covering developments for us from the Ukrainian city of Odessa. Earlier, I asked her what we should make of Russia's claim to be pulling out of Snake Island as, quote, an act of goodwill. Well, Terry, I think it's very interesting to see that framing uh, uh, of what happens uh, from the Russian perspective. Uh, they said they had, they wanted to show goodwill, that Russia wanted to show that they had no interest in blocking, uh, for example, UN humanitarian corridors in uh, the Black uh, the Black Sea. Uh, so that's for the Ukrainian, pers for the Russian, pardon me, perspective. On the Ukrainian side, of course, it is a symbolic retake of the Snake Island. You said. 
uh, you said it earlier, this had been, uh, well, one of the first victories for Russia on the onset of the war. This island where 13 Ukrainian border guards had uh, told Russians, uh, uh, well, where to go, like two Russian ships, warships had uh, captured the island, including the Moscow, the Moskva warship, which has since, uh, had since been, uh, uh, you know, uh, since uh, been, uh, in the, at the bottom of the Black Sea with no news from, uh, from the Russian soldiers that were on board. So very significant, also a huge morale boost for Ukrainian troops and for Ukrainians here. Sounds like you're really uh, under a deluge there with the rain falling. Uh, Emma, I hope you can hear me. Uh, what can you tell us about the prisoner swap between Ukraine and Russia that happened yesterday? Well, again, a very significant moment in that war. There have been uh, prisoners exchange uh, in the past, but usually it was about 12, 15, 20 soldiers from both sides. This time, we're talking about 144 soldiers on both sides, and it includes on the Ukrainian side the return of 95 uh, soldiers who fought uh, in the Azovstal steel plant, including 43 soldiers from the Azov uh, Battalion, uh, a regiment which uh, was a paramilitary military group which joined the Ukrainian army a few years back and uh, the Russian rhetoric is that this uh, group is a far-right group and they had always said before that those soldiers would be tried on Russian territory so that's really significant also because here in Ukraine those soldiers are considered as heroes. Ibrahim Sadun left for the front lines with his childhood teddy bear strapped to his military kit. He came to Ukraine from Morocco to study aerospatial sciences, but last November swapped his student visa for a military one and joined the army, much to the surprise of his friends. I was against that. And one of the main arguments he gave me was the fact that he's kind of feeling useless, so he wants to do something useful and find himself. But Brahim didn't serve long. He fought in Mariupol and surrendered to Russian forces, along with over a thousand fellow servicemen, mid-April. But the separatist authorities didn't treat him like a Ukrainian prisoner of war. They argued he was a foreign mercenary and put him on trial, along with two Britons. They are the first foreign fighters to be tried since the beginning of the war. At the beginning of June, all three were sentenced to death. Ukrainian authorities and NGOs both reject this verdict, as the separatist court in Donbas is not recognized by Kyiv or by the international community. It's a propaganda show. And um, in this case, first of all, the uh, uh, issue on the uh, institution, so-called court, uh, that pro provided this verdict. The uh, death uh, sentence is uh, not uh, uh, applicable and available on Ukrainian territory. We are on Ukrainian territory. So we consider it like the action of terrorist organization. And it's pure terrorist act that should be condemned and uh, uh, severally punished uh, on international and national level. We are dealing with the big terrorist group supported by terrorist state. For Brahim's family, the trial and death sentence came as a shock, and they say they haven't received any help from the Moroccan authorities so far. The moment when I seen the video of his captivity, I tried to contact the Moroccan embassy and where I am right now, and they literally were like, what do you expect us to do? I tried to reach many other uh, authorities, and sadly, the, everything was silent. I feel like they're just like scared to talk about it, maybe? Like literally just trying to keep it down, like he doesn't exist at all. Just like his family, Brahim's friends feel very alone in trying to help him out of this situation. They have launched a social media campaign and canvassed all around the city. We saw that these are very effective when we put a, a QR code on them because people started texting us on the social media campaign that we started, Save Brahim. They're like, we saw those clusters around the city and what can we do to help? Brahim's friend and family put what hope they have in the support they get from the public. While the separatists remain in charge in Donbass, 
That's about the only thing they can do. Well, the European uh, Court of Human Rights sees the case of Brahim Sadum along with that of the two Britons uh, he was sentenced to death uh, with, and the uh, European Court said it has taken measure to inform Russia that it shouldn't carry out uh, the sentence and that it should treat the prisoners of war according, according to the conventions protecting their rights. Emmanuel, Russian missiles continue to pound Ukrainian cities around the country. Is it clear what Russia is trying to achieve with these strikes, how they fit into Moscow's declared aim of taking control of the Donbass region. Well, I think there are two sides uh, of the objectives. First, when we see indiscriminate shelling on uh, civilian targets, for example, the supermarket in Fremenshuk on Monday uh, or uh, in Kiev on Sunday uh, morning on a residential uh, building, I think, you know, there's something to the fact that maybe they want to intimidate the population or just to inflict a blow to the morale of people here. And it does, uh, you know, it does work. People are, you know, uh, they are resilient, but they are quite shocked by those attacks on civilians. But there's also the aim to uh, control Donbass, and that's why we see heavy fighting on the eastern front line, especially around Lizichansk. The Russian troops have tried uh, several times now to storm into uh, the city. There's still uh, over a thousand inhabitants there, but they live in very dire situation with no water, no electricity, uh, you know, with constant uh, shelling. So uh, the fighting very much continues on, on the eastern side, which is still an objective for Russia. Russia. Emma, thank you very much. That was our correspondent Emmanuel Shahs there uh, on a very rainy day in the port city of Odessa. Returning to our main story this hour, NATO leaders are holding the final day of talks at their summit in Madrid. They're addressing rising food prices and insecurity caused by Russia's war on Ukraine. NATO leaders say Russia's blockade of grain exports is sparking instability around the world, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. Earlier at the summit, alliance members announced a new strategic plan naming Russia as its biggest threat. Sweden and Finland have been formally invited to join, and the U.S. has promised to bolster its forces stationed in Europe. NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg is expected to address the conference in just a moment. We'll be getting to that uh, shortly, we hope. Uh, but first, we've got some other news for you. Um, it's a, a remarkable return of a disgraced political dynasty. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has been sworn in, sworn in as president of the Philippines more than three decades after his father was ousted as dictator. Marcos Jr., also known as Bong Bong, took the oath of office after winning elections by a landslide. He was joined on stage at his inauguration by his mother, Imelda. Marcos Jr. praised his father, who ruled by martial law for nearly a decade as a leader who got things done. He has pledged to unite the country, create more jobs, and tame inflation. You picked me to be your servant, to enable changes to benefit all. I fully understand the gravity of the responsibility that you've put on my shoulders. I do not take it lightly, but I am ready for the task. And DW uh, correspondent Georg Matos attended the inauguration of Ferdinand Marcus Jr. in Manila, where thousands of people came out to show their support for the new president. It's the very moment that thousands of supporters of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. here at the National Museum in the heart of Manila have been waiting for. 36 years after being ousted from the Philippines, the Marcos dynasty is back in the seat of power. Ferdinand Marcos Jr. now faces an uphill battle to keep his election promises, like cutting the price of rice in half as inflation in the country is rising sharply. He will also have to balance relations between two superpowers, the United States on the one hand and China that has sent its vice president to the inauguration ceremony here in Manila on the other hand. The most difficult task of all, however, will be uniting a nation that is deeply split over its past. The opponents of Ferdinand Marcus Jr., but in particular the victims of the martial law period under his father, are deeply concerned that the sun could bring back the dark days of the dictatorship. 
a period that Ferdinand Marcus Jr. himself refers to as the golden era of the Philippines. And if you talk to supporters of Marcos here at the National Museum, that is exactly what they hope that Marcos will bring back to the Philippines. He's intelligent. He can manage everything, just like his dad, even, even better. He is a uh, very proud and uh, best man in, uh, in our country because he is the good leader in honor of his dad. He's going to continue the legacy of Duterte to fight against a uh, drug syndicate. He's, he is a very kind and uh, I think the Philippines will rise again. And that report from our correspondent Georg Matas in Manila. Tensions are high in India after police arrested two Muslim men accused of murdering a Hindu man and posting a video of it online. This comes after months of clashes between Hindus and Muslims. In response to the latest unrest, public gatherings have been banned and internet access suspended in some parts of India. Fire and fury on the streets in India. The sectarian murder of a Hindu tailor by two Muslim men in the northern state of Rajasthan has sparked outrage across the country. Tensions are running high amid several mass public protests. In the capital, Delhi, right-wing Hindu nationalist groups clashed with police as they vented their anger over the killing. We are protesting the killing of Kanaya Lal, who in spite of asking for police protection was not given any. This is a protest against the government, this is a protest to get justice for Kanaya, and this is a protest against the ever-increasing jihadi mindset in the country. The demonstrations continued at Kanaya Lal's cremation on Wednesday. His killers were arrested by police after they filmed themselves carrying out the murder in his shop in the city of Udaipur. In a second video, they threatened the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Their apparent motive was that the murdered man had recently praised the controversial political figure Nupur Sharma in a Facebook post, a move for which he was arrested before being released on bail. His bereaved wife told journalists the Facebook post was the sole reason for the killing. There was nothing else, just Facebook. They killed him for such a small thing. <laughs> Sharma, a well-known political figure, recently incensed Muslims in India and elsewhere by making derogatory remarks about the Prophet Muhammad, resulting in protests from Muslims. The ruling BJP party suspended her as a result. Officials in Udaipur have rushed to quell the religious tensions before they get any worse. They have imposed a curfew amid clashes with protesters and have tried to stop the murder video from spreading further online. But the killing has exposed the sectarian fault lines which run deep in a country run by a Hindu nationalist party, but in which around 170 million citizens are Muslims. A French court has handed down the maximum possible sentence for the only surviving perpetrator of the 2015 Paris, Paris terror attacks. Salah Abdeslam will serve life without parole for his part in a series of bombings and shootings which left 130 people dead. Uh, 19 other men were also found guilty for planning or aiding the attacks. It brings to an end a long-running trial with victims expressing their relief. Salah Abdeslam now faces life in prison. The toughest sentence available under French law. He's the sole surviving member of the Islamic State terror cell that carried out the deadly attacks in Paris in November 2015. The series of gun and bomb attacks killed 130 people in the French capital. The deadliest incident occurred at the Bataclan Theater 90 concert goers left dead after gunmen opened fire. For those who survived, the conclusion of the 10 month trial in this specially built Paris courthouse is just one step in the remedial process. Tonight, my reaction to the verdict is that I am relieved, but I am not proud 
because no one is ever proud when people are condemned to heavy penalties. I am relieved because one part of the process is now behind us, but we are still fighting to be reimbursed for our suffering by the government, and we will not give up this fight. It was justice, for sure. We're going to cut straight over to Madrid to hear Jens Stoltenberg, the, the NATO Secretary General, uh, during this NATO summit taking place there on day two. We have just um, concluded a transformative summit with uh, NATO's uh, heads of state and government with uh, far-reaching decisions to adapt our lines for the future. We agreed on the fundamental shift in our deterrence and defense. We agreed to invite Finland and Sweden to join our alliance. And we agreed on long-term support for Ukraine. We agreed NATO's new strategic concept. We agreed to step up in the fight against climate change and to establish a new one billion uh, innovation fund. We agreed to invest more in NATO and to increase uh, NATO's uh, common funded budgets. And we agreed to deepen our relationships with some of the alliance's closest partners, not least in the Indo-Pacific. Our final uh, session at the Madrid summit focused on threats and challenges from the Middle East North Africa and the Sahel. Insecurity in these regions has a direct impact on the security of all allies. And our new strategic concept identifies terrorism as one of the main threats to our security. Today, we reviewed our progress in the fight against terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. And we reconfirmed our commitment to continue the fight with determination and solidarity, including through intelligence sharing and support for our partners. NATO's training mission in Iraq is helping to prevent the return of uh, ISIS. For the first time, we have just agreed a defense capacity building package for Mauritania, helping to address border security irregular migration and terrorism. We have also agreed additional capacity building support for Tunisia and to continue supporting jo jo Jordan. We also address the global food crisis, uh, which is a direct result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The impact is severe, including on some of the world's most vulnerable people. Food prices are hitting record heights, and many countries depend on Ukraine for substantial wheat and other food imports. So allies discuss their efforts to mitigate the crisis and get grain out of Ukraine by land and on sea. We also addressed how Russia and China continue to seek political, economic and military gain across our southern neighborhood. Both Moscow and Beijing are using economic leverage, coercion, and hybrid approaches to advance their interest in the region. So today, we discussed how to address this growing challenge, including with even more support for NATO's partners in the region. We face the most serious security situation in decades. But we are rising to the challenge with unity and resolve. The decisions you have taken in Madrid will ensure that our alliance continue to preserve, preserve peace, prevent conflict, and protect our people and our values. Europe and North America standing together in NATO. Let me close by thanking Prime Minister Sanchez, the Spanish government, and the people of Madrid for hosting this historic summit. An excellent way to mark 40 years of Spain's membership in NATO. We will meet again for a NATO summit in Vilnius, Lithuania next year. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. <clears throat>
We'll start with uh, CNBC. Secretary General Hadley Gamble with CNBC News. Can I ask you to respond directly to the comments we heard overnight from Russian President Vladimir Putin? He essentially suggested that Sweden and Finland joining the alliance would require some kind of response from the Russian government. He said that if there were NATO weapon systems placed in those two countries, that that would precipitate a direct response from his government. And could I also ask you to respond directly to him and when he says that at this point, Ukraine should surrender completely and all he wants is the Donbass region. Also, we decide today uh, to support Ukraine, to make sure that Ukraine uh, prevails as an independent sovereign state in Europe. And uh, President Putin's uh, brutal war uh, uh, against Ukraine is absolutely unacceptable. It's uh, causing a lot of uh, death damage uh, um, for the Ukrainian people, but uh, it also has uh, ramifications uh, uh, over the whole world, not, re not least uh, because of the increase in food prices. So it's uh, President Putin that should uh, withdraw its forces and end this war immediately by stopping attacking a democratic sovereign nation and causing so much suffering in Ukraine. When it comes to Finland and Sweden, Finland and Sweden are sovereign nations, and they have the right to choose their own path and to join NATO. We have welcomed them into our alliance, and we are, of course, prepared for any eventuality. Um, but at the same time, I think what we see now in Ukraine um, demonstrates that uh, 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 Russia is now fully focused on that uh, war, uh, and, uh, and therefore also we have also taken note of the messages from Moscow, actually, uh, that. Uh, it doesn't change so much, uh, much that Finland and Sweden are joining the alliance. Well, they have communicated different messages from Moscow on that issue. Uh, the most important thing for us is that Finland and Sweden uh, will become members of uh, the alliance. We are there to protect all allies, and of course also Finland and Sweden, and we are prepared for all eventualities. Okay. We'll go to Swedish radio. Johan Andersson, Sveriges Radio. Uh, now you will apparently have another two member states, Sweden and Finland. Uh, what kind of challenges uh, will you have in terms of uh, unity? You have a lot of differences in way of these uh, groups of member states. We're talking about economics, politics, and military power. And the second question, if I may, when uh, will you sign the accession protocol? Thank you. <coughs> The political decision, uh, the real decision to invite uh, Finland and Sweden to join NATO was taken at this summit yesterday. Uh, so that decision has been taken, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we will do the formal signing of the accession protocol on Tuesday uh, with the presence of the uh, Swedish and Finnish uh, foreign ministers. But, but the reality, the decision has uh, been decided already with the political decision by all the leaders uh, yesterday at this uh, Madrid summit. Uh, then I think on the question of unity, I think that sometimes it's uh, easy to, in a way, confuse two very different things. Uh, NATO has never been uh, and will never uh, become a monolithic organization where 30 and soon 32 allies agree on every issue. We are 32 <laughs> different countries with different political parties in the in government and different culture, different history, different geography from both sides of the Atlantic. So you will, will always find differences. And for me, that's not a weakness. That's just an expression of uh, the, the strength of NATO, that we are democratic nations with a variety of different opinions on many issues. So if you define unity as a monolithic organization, we will never be that. But if you def define unity as something completely different, that, well, we are different, but we are able to unite and stand together on the core issues to protect and defend each other, then we have actually demonstrated unity and resolve at this summit, as we have done for more than 70 years. Um, providing the security, preserving peace, preventing war, uh, and sending a clear message to any potential adversary that we are there to protect and defend all allies. And, and as long as that is credible, which is easy in NATO, then no ally will be attacked. Na NATO's main purpose is to prevent war by having credible deterrence. 
Okay. DPA. Ansgar Hase, German Press Agency, DPA. Uh, Secretary General, you said that leaders agreed to invest more in NATO and to increase common funding. Um, can you please tell us by what percentage NATO will increase its common funding budgets? And the second question, if I may, um, do you support the idea of bringing Western main battle tanks to Ukraine? Thank you. Um, we support the idea of bringing uh, uh, a lot of advanced uh, uh, equipment, including also Western modern equipment, uh, many different types of equipment. You have seen announcements. Uh, and uh, we, there were also new announcements at this summit. So, uh, and actually NATO now has a, a task to help uh, Ukraine uh, transition from old Soviet area equipment to uh, modern uh, NATO standard equ uh, equipment. Uh, and of course, we are not a list of uh, equipments we rule, rule out or exclude from, uh, from, from that. Uh, Ukraine needs a, a wide range of modern uh, heavy uh, NATO standard equipment, uh, and that's a message also from this, uh, this summit. Then, um, on common funding, uh, we, are, we are following up uh, on the decision we made in principle last year, that we need to invest more together, um, uh, because in a more dangerous world we need to strengthen what we do together uh, in NATO. And we have decided a trajectory for common funding up to 2030. The, uh, Specific figures uh, will be decided in the yearly or annual budgets. Uh, what I can say is that the agreement we have reached today represent, uh, represents a, a considerable significant increase in NATO's common funded budgets. Uh, and that will enable us to invest more together in uh, pre-positioned equipment, in hardened shelters, in infrastructure, uh, and to ensure that uh, we can uh, plug and play uh, capabilities uh, together in NATO, uh, also with more command and control, and also to more, provide more support to our partners, and also to have more exercises. So it is a significant, considerable increase in NATO's common funded budget, and an agreed trajectory towards uh, 2030. Okay. ABC. Thank you, Secretary General Esteban Villarejo from Spanish newspaper ABC. Uh, first of all, uh, could you give us some more uh, impressions about the Spanish organization of the summit as a hosted nation? And secondly, could you clarify if NATO's position regarding Ceuta and Melilla, the, the two autonomous cities of Spain, has changed anything after the new strategic concept? Uh, above all, regarding to the Article 5. Thank you very much. The hosting by the Spanish government of this uh, summit has been perfect, impeccable, excellent. And uh, uh, all allies expressed their gratitude to Spain uh, for hosting us in Madrid, a beautiful city, at the Royal Palace and at the Prado Museum, and then at this uh, uh, conference here where uh, all the facilities have been in place uh, and actually provided the, the best possible framework for a historic NATO summit. Uh, a summit that has taken uh, transformative decisions for our alliance. We have the new Madrid uh, NATO strategic concept and we have all the other uh, decisions. So, so we are extremely grateful to, to, uh, to the Spanish government, to Pedro Sanchez, uh, the Prime Minister, and, and the people of Madrid in the way uh, uh, you have hosted us. And also it, I think it demonstrates that Spain is really a highly valued and important NATO ally. And it's a very good way for Spain to, uh, to celebrate, to mark the uh, 40th anniversary of your membership. Um, on um, which territories um, NATO protects and South America, Malia, uh, well, NATO is there to protect uh, all allies against any threat. Um, uh, at the end of the day, it will always be a political decision to invoke Article uh, 5. Uh, but rest assured, NATO is there to protect and defend all allies. Politico. Thanks very much. David Herzenhorn with Politico Europe. Uh, Secretary General, throughout the uh, summit and in the strategic concept, we hear echoes of the Cold War. But of course, the nuclear non-proliferation architecture has fallen away. We have unprecedented numbers of troops on the eastern flank, uh, a hot war, not a Cold War in Ukraine. Has the world entered an era that is even more dangerous than the Cold War? And based on your discussions with leaders, 
you have a sense that there's consensus and unity around what are the red lines that Russia must not cross to avoid a direct conflict with NATO? We live in a more dangerous world, uh, and we live in a more unpredictable world, and we live in a world where we have actually a hot war going on in Europe uh, with uh, the large-scale uh, military operations we haven't seen uh, in Europe since the Second World War. And of course, this is uh, imposing suffering on the Ukrainian people, and we see it every day, and we pay tribute to their courage, to their um, bravery, um, and we also convey that message to uh, President Zelensky when he addressed uh, the, the summit. Uh, at the same time, we also know that this can get worse, because if this becomes a full-scale war between Russia and NATO, then we will see suffering, damage, death, destruction uh, at a scale which is much, much worse than what we see in uh, Ukraine today. And therefore, NATO fundamentally has two tasks. One is to provide support to Ukraine. NATO and NATO allies provide uh, unprecedented support to Ukraine. We are stepping up. and We agree the package at this summit. But we also have a, a, a core responsibility, of course, to prevent escalation beyond Ukraine. And that's the reason why NATO is not a uh, part of the conflict on the ground. We support our uh, highly valued uh, partner, um, Ukraine, but we're not part of the conflict. And also why uh, we have so significantly increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance with more than 40,000 troops under direct NATO command to remove any room for miscalculation, misunderstanding uh, in Moscow about uh, our readiness to protect every inch of NATO territory. And that's, that's NATO's core responsibility, to, 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 to make sure that there is no misunderstanding in the minds of any adversary, that if they do anything like well, what Russia has done to, uh, to, to, to Georgia in 2008 or Ukraine now, that will trigger the full response from the whole alliance. And that's the main message. And, and, and that is credible. And that's the reason why we are preventing attack and preserving peace for NATO allies, close to one billion people. Uh, the last question will go to Deutsche Welle NPR. Hi, thank you. Terry Schultz with Deutsche Welle. Um, Mr. Secretary General, you said that allies had spoken about how to help mitigate food insecurity and, and the, the spreading of hunger, but what did they decide? Is, is this NATO's role and what can you do? And could you also address these reports that the Russians have left, uh, for whatever reasons, Snake Island? Will this help? free up uh, shipping routes. Thank you. Um, so NATO allies, so first of all, I think it's important that NATO allies meet uh, and, uh, uh, and coordinate and discuss and exchange uh, views and compare notes on the different efforts that NATO allies are involved in to try to get uh, more grain out of Ukraine, uh, to get food out of Ukraine. Um, uh, second, it's also important just to convey the message that contrary to what President Putin and actually also China and now are telling the world uh, through different disinformation campaigns, that, that, that this food crisis is not caused by NATO sanctions. It's caused by President Putin's war. And the best way to end the food crisis is to end the war. And President Putin can end the war tomorrow uh, by redrawing his uh, forces. Um, then different allies are involved in different ways. Um, uh, Turkey plays a key role in trying to facilitate some kind of agreement. Um, also, Greece announced that they are ready to uh, make available ships to get uh, uh, grain out of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and other allies are involved in different diplomatic efforts to get some kind of agreement uh, to allow ships to sail uh, with food, uh, wheat, uh, uh, over the Black uh, Sea. Uh, then, um, Lithuania. Uh, other countries uh, uh, also updated uh, us on their efforts to uh, Romania and other countries updated us on their efforts to expand the on land capacity uh, by uh, railway to uh, transport more uh, uh, food uh, on land. Uh, it's very hard to compensate fully what we can transport by ships, but on land is also a way, and, and several NATO allies are engaged in, in that. And of course, the, the most, NATO's role is to protect and defend allies uh, and to ensure and to create a space for them uh, to operate, and that's what we uh, do. 
thank you very much. This concludes the last press conference uh, of the Secretary General for the summit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, great to have you here. Uh, you all here at this uh, summit. Thank you. And if you're just joining this uh, on DW News, we were just watching uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, speaking at a news conference on the second day, the second and final day of that important NATO summit taking place in Madrid, Spain. The Secretary General reiterated that NATO is facing its most serious security challenge in decades. He pledged again long-term support, his words, long-term support for Ukraine in its war with Russia. Uh, he also noted that there is there are competing narratives. There, there's a lot of disinformation out there, he said, regarding the question of uh, what's holding up the food supply, grain supplies coming from Ukraine. Uh, he said that Russia and China are both involved in disinformation campaigns, trying to portray it as a... Uh, as being NATO. We're going to cross straight back over to the conference. I understand that German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is going to address the news conference as well. It's okay, no, actually not. My producer tells me in my ear that is not happening at this moment. So let's go straight over to our correspondent, Alexandra Phenomen, who is standing by for us. Also in the studio, we have Julia Saldelli. Uh, let's start with you, Alexandra. The, uh, we just finally heard that, that press conference, which we've been waiting for, for for quite a while, about an hour it was delayed. What are your main takeaways from it? Beide Länder werden unser Bündnis nachhaltig stärken, militärisch und politisch. Ich freue mich sehr, dass es in unglaublich kurzer Zeit gelungen ist, beide Länder in die Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Solange der Prozess der Aufnahme noch nicht formal ganz abgeschlossen ist. It's not yet been fully concluded. NATO's importance for our security, for the security of Europe and peace in the world, is greater than it has been for a long time. Russia's aggression has shattered the post-war order of the last decades. Much that we have taken for granted in our world has been called into question. The security of borders, respect for international law, peaceful mechanisms to solve and settle conflicts, a civilized way of dealing with one another. In such a world, one needs good and close friends. That is how I put it at the day of the conclusion of the G7 summit in Elmau. And this is especially true here at NATO's meeting. 30, soon 32 states that stand close following the motto, one for all, all for one. Countries that would be willing to risk life and limb to come to one's others, one another's rescue. That is what NATO stands for. And that is what we felt here during the meeting in Madrid, during the working sessions and do, during all the encounters. And it's a good feeling. Indeed, the true strength of our alliance is to be found in the fact that we stand up for our values and principles on the foundation, for our freedom on the foundation of our shared values and principles of our own will and conviction. Because of Russia's aggression on Ukraine, the international situation has changed dramatically, and NATO is drawing the right conclusions, the new strategic concept, that is. The core tasks of NATO remain the same, the defense of the alliance territory and the mutual defense guarantee enshrined in, shrined in Article 8. What is new is our view of Russia. Through its aggressive policy, Russia again constitutes a threat to the alliance, and it threatens the international order. Thus, NATO strengthens its ability to defend itself, especially with an eye to the security of its members along the eastern flank of NATO. As NATO, we increase our presence in the Baltic states, in Poland, in Romania, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. The NATO Secretary General said that the new force structure will equal 300,000 and it will be supported by Germany in a credible and substantial manner. We announced that we would make available a combat-ready brigade to defend Alliance territory, and in so doing, we've set the tone in the Alliance. As I said, we will make available a regional Navy command and will assume leadership responsibility in the maritime area. In addition, the Federal Armed Forces will make available an armored division equaling 
15,000 troops to defend Northeast Europe, more than 60 aircraft and up to 20 marine units, make them available on a permanent basis. As logistics hub in Europe, we also make a strategic, strategically important contribution to the collective defense of NATO. Today already, we have enhanced our presence along the eastern flank through our contributions to the air surveillance across Poland and Romania, and through contributing to the NATO troops in the Slovak Republic, and have enhanced our contribution thus geographically. We've made available patriots. Our contribution on land, at sea, and in the air will be enhanced and strengthened further. And we will, as I said, help set up a maritime naval command for the East, for the Baltic Sea. And the new full structure of the alliance will be adapted to the new situation. As I said, we will make available an armored division. As logistics hub in Europe, we also make a strategically important contribution to the collective defense of the alliance. In our discussions today, many of our partners expressly acknowledge the substantial German contributions, and as, did, as was the case for the special fund we agreed recently, many colleagues called this an impulse for the substantial increase of their own defense expenditure. Of course, we also focused on the topic of Ukraine during our meetings here in Madrid. President Zelensky joined us by video link, and he described, as he did in his contributions to the EU summit and the G7 summit, the situation in his country. Apart from individual support by more than four dozen countries, NATO supports Ukraine in the non-lethal area in the framework of the existing NATO-Ukraine cooperation, and it does so in practical terms. We also had time for bilateral meetings on the fringes of the conference. Interestingly enough, uh, we had for the very first time partners from the Asia-Pacific attend the summit, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. Allow me to conclude by expressing my gratitude to our host, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez. This was a summit that was excellently organized and highlighted once again what an important ally Spain is for all of us. I would also like to point out that we had the opportunity to make progress on another international issue on the fringes of this summit, and this concerns a matter that affects the Western Balkans, an issue that is very dear to my heart, as you may know. I met more than once with the president of North Macedonia, Slivo Pendarovsky, and I also met with Bulgaria's president. I met with leading politicians and talked to many of them on the phone yesterday and today. We've moved much closer to a solution of this conflict. The French Council Presidency has submitted a new proposal which bears in mind uh, the sensitivities of, all, of both sides. They want to look at that proposal in the coming days, and I have the hope that we will have been able to Put, do away with the impediments on the path to uh, the, pa uh, the path of North Macedonia into the European Union. I have a whole host of questions for the floor. Christina Duns and then Moritz Koch. Christina Duns. Herr Bundeskanzler, um, Chancellor, you said that Germany is going to support the Ukraine as long as it needs as it is necessary. And you submitted proposals for a kind of Marshall Plan. Apart from the fact that we cannot provide endless support, what would you say to the German public that in the fight for freedom and Ukraine, you, that they have to expect to also have to pay a price for supporting Ukraine in these difficult times? We have expressed and shown the solidarity to Ukraine that it needs, and we will continue to do so. And I know that I am in line here with the German public. The sanctions that we have imposed on Russia are part and parcel of that approach, and we are working with our friends and allies. And they do have an effect on us. We try to calibrate them in a way that they hit Russia first and foremost, especially its ability to 
uh, prosper in economic terms so that President Putin cannot just continue this war. But it is obvious, and it has been obvious, that we would also have to weather consequences. Once the war began, I said we will have to prepare for a difficult situation with regard to energy supplies, and thus we will contribute to ensuring that we become more independent. We took necessary decisions with regard to coal and oil, and we will also have to take the necessary steps to become more independent from gas imports from Russia. So we will speed up and facilitate the procedure setting up LNG terminals and pipelines along the northern coast of Germany. Uh, the, of course, all the difficulties with regard to the supplies affect Germany already, and the citizens of our country are quite aware of that. Nächstes. Moritz Koch. Thank you, Chancellor. A question regarding Kaliningrad. We have had reports that the federal government is trying to mediate on this matter in order to allow for transit to continue between Russia and Kaliningrad. Are you afraid that this, if we were not successful, we might witness an escalation? And what do you say to critics who say that if we give in here now, this would be an expression of weakness towards Russia? And another brief question, because we have just seen that there is a new open letter that's been sent up in which the federal government is called upon to stop and review its deliveries of weapons. Do you feel reaffirmed in the course you've decided to continue to auch dadurch, dass die russische Regierung offenbar entschieden hat, das russische Militär die Schlangeninsel zu räumen. Now that the Russian military has decided to remove from Snake Island, which was under heavy artillery. As far as your question regarding Kaliningrad is concerned, this is a matter to will be tackled by the European Union. They have to determine the framework conditions, and they, these conditions have to be agreed upon in the light of the fact that we are talking uh, about transport between two parts of Russia. And I think all parties involved in that regard are working hard to bring about a de-escalatory dynamic. That is how I see it. The letter you referred to uh, has not come to my notice, so I cannot comment on it, but I'd like to assure you that I believe it to be right to act as we've done, that we supply weapons to Ukraine so as to enable them to defend itself and that we make those weapons available that are important in the present defense strategy uh, of Ukraine, part and parcel of which are the howitzers that we've delivered. And you know that our Minister of Defense has announced we will increase our deliveries, expand them. And I stand by the decision that we've taken that we will make available multiple rocket launch systems together with the United States. And it also includes all the deliveries we have initiated in order to make Ukraine capable of defending itself against acts, attacks from the air. Um, that also includes the modern system RST. Michael Fischer. Michael yeah. Fischer. Thank you very much, Chancellor. I would like to build on the uh, question on weapons deliveries. You said that Germany is delivering what other allies deliver too. Is NATO still in agreement to not send combat tanks to Ukraine? We know that Spain is a country that would have been ready to do so. I will happily repeat what you are also what, what you have reflected in your question. We always. Uh, look at what other allies do, especially the U.S., and we will continue to do so. Christopher Ziedler, over here. Yeah. Chancellor, over the past few days, you've had many talks, also twice with President Zelensky. How do you assess the military prospects for Ukraine over the coming weeks and months and in its effort to push back the Russian army. We heard about uh, Snake Island today and the Western uh, arms supplies in that context. Do you think that uh, you are doing enough? Do the prospects indicate that over the coming weeks and months Ukraine can reach its goal? 
I would recommend to everybody and myself as well to be uh, rather calm about the future military prospects. Uh, to it is a very difficult situation. It is marked by the in unbelievable brutality of the Russian aggression that we see on a daily basis. For me, it is also clear that when what is important in Ukraine is uh, the courage and the bravery of the Ukrainian soldiers. They are also very able with their military command, defending its country with great commitment and determination, and arms deliveries of many countries, of course, help Ukraine to put up this resistance over such a long time frame. And this is what brings me back to what I said in the beginning. I will repeat it. We will do this as long as it takes, but I cannot make any predictions about how long that time frame will be. Um, I don't think that would be a serious projection at this point. Markus Preis, over here. I at the um, Chancellor, I have two questions. NATO yesterday adopted its new strategic concept, adopting a new vision on Russia. Do you think that the NATO-Russia founding act is part is part of history? Uh, NATO also, uh, the US said they will have a permanent command in Poland that would contradict uh, the NATO-Russia founding act, and you also said that. Uh, Article 5 also applies in a certain way, or assistance applies to Sweden and Finland already now. Is that uh, only a, um, a spoken message, or are there plans for that? Well, we already made this announcement when we spoke about the possibility of an applic application for membership. This is something that is just part of our obligations in a spirit of solidarity that we owe one another. And especially with a view to the accession process, this is very relevant. And I just hi wanted to make this um, assurance once again. It is a delicate phase when you take such decisions. And uh, I would also like to reiterate what we also heard from the Russian president once more, who was rather unimpressed and has taken note of this. So I think it is something where, despite the delicate situation right now, we do not expect uh, more tensions between NATO and Russia at this point. This is what the situation looks like today. Of course, there are certain uncertainties uh, linked to the current situation that will NATO-Russia Founding Act. Yes, it is uh, there. It has not been cancelled, and that's uh, correct, because every time you look into the document, you can read out to Russia what it has committed to, and uh, saying that borders are inviolable, that you cannot move borders by the use of force, that the sovereignty and integrity of states cannot be called into question. And there are many other points in this document. But of course, what Russia has done is a blatant breach of the rules enshrined in the NATO-Russia Founding Act, and it is ever more important to be able to uh, refer back to that document. So NATO is not breaching these rules. Uh, what we're doing is still uh, in line with the, what is enshrined in that document. Süddeutsche Zeitung. Chancellor, you spoke about the far-reaching decisions that have been taken here in Madrid. Do you have the feeling that what that means for Germany and the German population, this total change of the security situation and the security environment, the increase of uh, Bundeswehr capabilities, do you think the population as well, the public has understood what that means and what the changes mean? And do you think it is a challenge to explain this to the population? Well, after the Russian war of aggression, I spoke about a watershed moment that is linked to that war. And the consequences include, I believe, absolutely that the Bundeswehr needs to be strong enough to make its contribution to territorial defense and alliance defense. And this is why I said that we will take, uh, we will increase our expenditures, our military spending for national defense for the Bundeswehr. And we also have uh, started a special fund for the Bundeswehr, everybody knows the situation is serious, and I think that the logic behind these decisions is something that our citizens very well understand. At least this is what I get as a feedback from my many discussions with the people in our country. They really support this on a broad basis. Another question over here. 
Stefanie Lob von AFP. Stefanie Lob, AFP. Thank you very much. What would your answer be to the Russian president's statement saying that NATO had imperialist ambitions? Thank you. Well, to be honest, it is ridiculous because actually NATO is a defensive alliance. It does not attack other countries and it doesn't plan to do so. It is not a threat to anyone in its neighborhood and it is actually Putin who is who has imperialism as the goal of his policies. He is the one who writes essays saying that part of his neighboring countries were actually part of his own country. And in Ukraine, he has put these words into action. He has tried to conquer territory. And that is what imperialism is and means. And you have to call a spade a spade. Thank you. Thomas Kutschka, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Chancellor, the Czech Secretary General of NATO said in Madrid at the summit that he thought it would be wrong for allies to have restrictions on um, arms exports. Finland and Sweden have uh, committed vis-a-vis -vis Turkey to lift their national restrictions on these exports in order to show and reflect solidarity with that ally. Since 20, at the end of 2019, Germany has a partial restriction on exports towards Turkey. Is the federal government willing to reassess these restrictions and um, probably lift it? Well, we have not taken any general decisions about uh, NATO countries. These are case-by-case -case decisions looked at individually in any case, and we've been doing so over the last few years, and we will continue to do that in the future, too. But, of course, these are case-by-case -case decisions for individual uh, topics and not basic general decisions. These don't exist, and we do not intend to take them in one or the other direction. Alejandra Burkhardt from Politico. Chancellor, the question I wanted to ask uh, originally was also already asked. Let me come back to the 300,000 soldiers. Uh, there are different ideas about by when they should be ready. The Secretary General spoke about 2023. Yeah, the Defense Minister said 2025, your Defense Minister. Uh, what is the time frame you have agreed upon uh, on w in which year should they be uh, ready? and? If I may, briefly, there was this rather ugly scene in Elma where there was a lot of criticism about your response. I think you uh, referred to something that you've already um, answered, but I would like to give you the opportunity to make a public comment on that as well, if you like so to do so. I will be happy to um, answer expansively on everything you mentioned. Well, the question of the quickly uh, available forces uh, and the huge increase, we see this is a far-reaching commitment of all NATO allies because they need to launch changes very quickly. Over the years, there has been this idea that uh, long-term announcements might be an indicator that you would uh, prepare to an attack. This has proven wrong. We know that Russia has long planned its attack on Ukraine, probably. It remains something that we uh, need to react to. Um, we need to. We have learned that we need to be able to react qu quickly, and we will do so as soon as possible by making available forces. I gave you the dimensions earlier, and we will do, contribute our share as quickly as possible. Part of that is all the uh, the orders for military equipment, infrastructure, uh, ammunition, spare parts, all these things that had been problematic in the past. We, we will work on these things, and the faster we make progress, the more successful there will be a swift uh, build-up, and we will hopefully soon be able to announce that this huge number of immediately available forces can be mobilized at any point in time. And that's also a message to everybody who wants to uh, might want to launch an attack on NATO territory. Nikki Haley from CNBC. 
Hi, Chancellor. Hadley, Hadley Gamble with CNBC, CNBC News. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for taking, taking my question, question, and I apologize for speaking in English. I want to ask you about your government's support for energy giant Uniper. Can you confirm that the German government will be ready to support other energy companies and other industrial giants if they have trouble making their bottom line as a result of the sanctions on Russian energy? And also, sir, could you respond directly to Vladimir Putin's comments regarding Sweden and Finland? He's essentially said that if there is any NATO hardware in those two countries, that Russia will be forced to respond. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, concerning the second question, the real message is the one that I have tried to convey earlier, and that is that very obviously we have to assume that Russia will has, has accepted the accession of uh, Sweden and Finland to NATO. It was a right decision that the two uh, heads of government or state in these two countries have taken and uh, it is supported by public opinion in both countries, but also by the parliaments. So I think this is uh, our assessment. I can also assure you that Germany has a, um, a tradition of um, when companies see, see shocks due to outer circumstances, as has been in the COVID-19 pandemic, we are certainly willing to do uh, necessary things. What is necessary cannot be um, said in general terms, but we do have opportunities to do something, and the willingness to do something is there. You have seen this during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the measures we've taken have been effective, and this is a very good tradition. Next question over here. Mr. Chancellor, you said that Germany will support Ukraine with arms deliveries, but then we also hear very often from uh, Minister Lambrecht that what Germany is um, delivering also hampers Germany's um, uh, capabilities. That's what she said about the Panzerhaubitze, the Howitzer. Of course, Germany has had limited uh, military budgets before, has made a lot of savings in that area. But what U Ukraine has gotten has not been sufficient to fight off Russia's aggression. So the first question is, what can you tell Ukrainians? Can you reassure them that Germany and other allies have enough weapons in order to make deliveries to Ukraine so Ukraine can defend itself. Thank you. Well, we have committed to deliver arms, also arms that are necessary to act in the current situation so Ukraine can defend itself. I addressed some of them before. The Panzerhaubitze, the Howitzer, uh, has been mentioned before. And as I said, as the minister has announced the deliveries that we've prepared with the Netherlands already and that we have made, and we have also trained many Ukrainian soldiers on these uh, equipments, we are also preparing further deliveries right now. Anadesh Bloomberg. Um, Chancellor, one more question about gas. How concerned are you when you think about the upcoming winter and gas supply for Germany? Do you fear that in mid-July, due to uh, maintenance works, uh, the gas tab will be switched off? Nord Stream 1 is what I'm referring to. And once again about Uniper. Would you support Uniper in case they really get into rough waters? Uh, the Minister of uh, Economics has warned about a Lehman Brothers effect in the energy sector if bigger corporations might uh, be in difficulties. Well, I tried to answer that question before, and I will happy to do a second attempt um, to take up your question as well. Um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the uh, what has been done in practice, what is to be done, what can be done, and we will be happy to build on that if it is necessary. But this is a case-by-case -case, um, decision, and we cannot make any abstract assumptions about this. Next winter, yes, thank you for that question. As of December last year, when I became chancellor, I 
have looked at the question of what do we do when we have problems with energy supplies with my whole government, because this might have been a possible escalation resulting from the conflict that had existed already, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and the big threat that Russia posed to Ukraine at that point in time, a threat that led to the start of the war, the Russian aggression in February, and had then materialized. And because we did this, I was able to react only a few days after on this Sunday in the German parliament that we will build LNG terminals and that we will change the law, that we speed the processes up, and that we will contribute to filling gas storage we have taken decision that we will continue to work with coal power plants in order to save gas and took other um, measures also and launched um, new laws in order to keep up the speed and get it done in time. And I think this is what's happening at full speed. We have really um, started to prepare the ground in time since my government has been in power. and. Several years ago, we should already have prepared for that situation that from one day to the next, for whichever reason, there might be difficulties in energy supplies. And that, I mean, that's something one could talk about. But the situation now is that we are working at full speed to get things done. What we hope, of course, is that we are over prudent, that we have done more than would have been absolutely necessary, but we cannot predict this at this point in time. We also need to be prepared for difficult situations, and that's what we're doing. Uh, Dan Michaels, Mid Wall Street Journal. Frederick Chancellor, my German isn't really that good. Um, you referred to your speech on February 27th when you announced a complete change in many areas of German policy, uh, particularly on the military. It was almost 180 degrees from generations of policy. Do you think that the admin Defense Administration and the Bundeswehr are moving fast enough in response to your changes, uh, especially? dealing with Ukraine, and earlier in response to a question, you urged a degree of calm about the situation in Ukraine and the unfolding of the battles. But President Zelensky is expressing anything but calm um, and calling for a greater degree of urgency. Is Germany moving fast enough to deliver the weapons that President Zelensky is asking for? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question, and also for having pointed out that a dramatic change has taken place with respect to Germany's security strategy that I announced in February this year and then also pushed through Parliament and also pushed through in practical terms. Uh, also with regard to the question whether the people responsible in the Federal Armed Forces are actually implementing these this turnaround, so to speak, uh, with uh, the appropriate speed. Yes, we are performing with the speed, best possible speed. Everyone wants to make uh, these changes reality as quickly as possible. The minute these Ukrainian soldiers had been trained, they were returned to Ukraine ready for action. So you can rely on this actually running smoothly. The last but one question goes to Gregor Mainz. Chancellor, you pointed to the way in which your NATO partners responded to the announcement of a one billion special fund on defense. How sustainable is it? Should you be re-elected for second term? Can you assure us that you will stand by fulfilling that 2% goal even if that one billion fund will be empty by them? I responded to that question when I announced the establishment of that fund. In a way, it is a change in orientation, so to speak. We are to have chosen a fast lane because this has to be something of a long-term approach. Once the one billion fund has been depleted, we will, of course, have to continue to invest in order to 
perhaps we may not have to invest as much as we do at this point in time. As I said, we're switching lanes here, and this special fund that we're setting up allows us to switch into a faster lane. Once we've got that speech, we will not have to invest as much as we have to do in order to change lanes. Federal Chancellor, you see Vladimir Putin's approach. What has to happen for him to stop this war? Thank you. No one, I believe, is in a position to say who knows what goes on in his head. We are not his advisors. We don't know who his advisors are. Some of them are still there. Nobody knows. Whatever we are doing is aimed to ensure that Putin realizes it will not work, whatever he's trying to dictate peace to Ukraine, and that he has to cut short his war and end it. And as long as necessary, as I said, as long as it takes, we will stand at the side of Ukraine, and sanctions will not come to an end should a dictated peace have occurred. So it doesn't make sense to continue as it does these days. And we are witnessing terrible, massive destruction in the Ukraine. Terrible, horrible violations of any rules we have agreed to. Houses are being demolished, infrastructure is being destroyed, civilians, children, senior people, sick people are being killed, are terrified. It is a horrible war and it doesn't make sense, not even from the Russian point of view. They're not only destroying Ukraine, they're also destroying their very own future. So the point has to be made time and again that the time has come for an end of the war. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your interest. And this concludes the press conference. Have a safe journey home. And that was German Chancellor Olaf Scholz speaking in Madrid at the NATO summit. Uh, just before him, we heard the, US, the uh, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg speaking as well. Well, let's get some insights on what we've just heard. Uh, joining me here in the studio is our correspondent, Julia Saudelli. And on location in Madrid, covering that summit for us, is our Brussels bureau chief, Alexandra von Namen. Uh, first of all, Alexandra, uh, Talk to me about what we just heard from Chancellor Schultz. He outlined a number of military contributions that Germany wants to make to NATO. Uh, was there anything new there? What, what is he offering? Yes, I think it was quite notable how precise the German Chancellor was there talking about the German contribution to NATO high readiness units. As you know, NATO has promised to uh, boost their high readiness, readiness units from 40,000 to 300,000 soldiers and 